Welcome to Stay Tuned, the show for animation lovers. As always, I'm your host, Phil Maki, and tonight I have part two in The Lost Interviews. These are some shows that I recorded last year, 2018, uh, before Stay Tuned had a home on YouTube. It was only a radio style show at that point. And I had three interviews um, that were only on the radio portion. They never got a home on YouTube. And so I decided to go back and to take all three of those and record them, especially, especially now <laughs> for YouTube. So basically, I'm just reintroducing a show that already exists, but that nobody could hear unless they were subscribing to the show on Patreon, which of course you are welcome to do. Uh, but I decided it would be cool to have a little bit of a video component for these, these interviews that were really special to me because they were my first ones. So I hope you enjoy it. This one is with Dave Finkel. He is a writer who back in the 90s worked on a little show called Pinky and the Brain. And I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, away we go. You're listening to Stay Tuned, recorded live on Station Head Radio and also streaming on Patreon. Coming to you from Austin, Texas, I'm Phil Maki. Thank you so much for joining me for this June 2018 episode. On tonight's show, I'll be welcoming writer Dave Finkel to talk with me about all things animated. We'll be discussing his career as a comedy writer and even how he originally started out as an actor. All that, and you'll have a chance to share your thoughts, questions, and opinions with me, live and on the air. If you're a fan of Stay Tuned and would like to listen anytime, be sure to head on over to patreon.com forward slash filmaki to become a subscriber today. Subscribing gives you the freedom to stream and pause episodes of this show at your convenience, and the various levels allow you to unlock some very cool rewards too. You know, when I'm not watching cartoons, I make regular visits to Dragon's Lair Comics and Fantasy. Located in central Austin, Texas, you can find all measure of tabletop gaming, comic books, and geeky merchandise to build your collections or provide unique gift ideas. For a complete listing of their in-store events and tournament schedules, visit them in person today or at dlair.net. On tonight's show, I'll be interviewing Dave Finkel. As a writer for Fox's hit sitcom New Girl, Dave has also written for animation going all the way back to the mid-90s on shows like Animaniacs, Duckman, and most prominently, for Pinky and the Brain. I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Dave recently about his writing career, but first, this. Dave Finkel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very excited to be here. I'm glad we can make this work. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. It's good to have you here. My pleasure. So, so as as I understand it, um, you are for, you're a current writer, but you are a former animation writer, currently live action writer. Is that right? Currently live action writer. About six months ago, I shot my very last frame of the show New Girl. Yeah, uh, it was oh, wow. Zoe Deschanel on Fox. I was on that for seven years. I ran it from the pilot on with my partner and uh, Liz Merriweather, and uh, now we're we're on to other things. That's you know that is a huge show, as you might have heard. <laughs> I, you know, I you'd be shocked because like I'm so I'm so inside of it that I really don't have a context for it beyond what I you know I'm in the editing room and I'm on stage and all that kind of stuff. So. I don't. I know people watch it. I just don't have a sense of it. So it's nice to hear. Yeah. Well, it is a great show, and I have enjoyed it since the very beginning. So uh, definitely talking to a fan. <laughs> ah, well, thank you. Glad, yes. Glad, uh, glad we provided some laughs over those seven years. It was definitely a uh, we bled for that one, and it was enjoyable. Yeah, it's it's got a quirky, uh, quick wit to it that I think is probably what kept it going. Yeah. No, it was, it was definitely a twenty four seven operation. As most good, you know, most solid shows are of that of that ilk. Well, but so many years ago, many years ago, I don't want to say how many, but many. Uh, back in 1995, uh, you were working yes. on a show called Pinky and the Brain. Yes, I was. And it's not a lie. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and I am not going to lie when I say I definitely watched it. I guess awesome. my. 
Yeah. And my first question, of course, for those random people out there who may not know this, I don't know, I guess more and more of them who didn't grow up with it may not know this, but Pinky and the Brain was a spinoff of Animaniacs. That's correct. Which is not very common to have a spinoff cartoon of another cartoon. I feel like Pinky and the Brain was a special little thing that just sort of like took on a a life of its own. It was pretty... um... It was a very special experience, for sure. And that's awesome. I mean, I'm glad that you enjoyed the... You enjoyed the experience as well. That's always important. I very much did. It was my first. It was my first real gig um, as a writer, and uh, I didn't know what to expect. And it was it was pretty impressive. Within my first couple of weeks of working there, I was sitting in a boardroom with Steven Spielberg talking about the show, which is not a little thing when you're 20. 26 years old oh my gosh no that's um, just awesome getting your feet under you yeah it's pretty amazing yeah i'm kind of a big spielberg fan so um i'm, I'm slightly jealous right now <laughs> yeah it was pretty intense like i, I didn't know when, like it was a scary thing because you're like what what's this gonna be like I, is spielberg gonna be a part of this and i've done three different projects with him over the course of you know however many years and he is surprisingly hands-on um and not in a bad way you know, a lot of times you get people with their names on the on the marquee, and they weigh in, and you just sort of like, "This is the word of God," and that definitely is the way it was with Stephen. But then he's also the first to go. You know, if you if you enact one of his notes, he's the first to go. Like when he watches the cut or something later on, or he reads the script, he's like, well, "Why'd you do this?" And you said, and you go, "Oh, you." suggested we should do this thing and he's like oh no don't listen to me i'm the worst so he's <laughs> he's the most humble of all of them which is it's uh such a breath of fresh air oh that's actually really interesting i've always wondered about you know when it says steven spielberg presents how much he was really involved so that's cool to hear taking the band for whatever reason back when the wb was a network i don't know if any of your, <laughs> your listeners will remember that i i remember uh, <laughs> all too poorly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was an interesting time. So they had this mad idea that they wanted to try and develop Pinky and the Brain into a primetime series that would rival The Simpsons. So it's a show about two mice taking over the world that they wanted to turn into The Simpsons. And everyone was sort of like, how are we going to do this? So I remember trying to figure out our season. And when we, when we sort of had a version of it locked in, Peter Hastings and all the other writings, writers went to Steven's office and we pitched out the season to him and he gave notes and it was as hands-on as any other show I've ever been on with an executive producer. He's definitely a part of the thing, loves getting his hands dirty, is very quick. He's First of all, he's got an incredibly quick mind, as, as you might not be shocked to hear, but also very quick to pull back on, on his own stuff and like admit he's wrong, which is such a rarity. That's really good to know, actually. And really funny, like a, a genuinely funny guy. Oh, cool. Oh, well, I yeah. would hope he has a good sense of humor, especially... You know, just with the the plot of Pinky and the Brain alone, if you just think of what that story is, it's it's pretty ridiculous that it got a show at all. Absolutely, and he was he'd be the first like when we were writing that show, some of the stuff we would come up with was slightly esoteric, like uh, you know references to you know the the first one that I wrote with my partner was a parody of Brian's song. Now nobody will remember Brian's song. It was a TV <laughs> movie from the mid to late seventies about Brian Piccolo starring James Caan and Billy Dee Williams. Uh, the episode became called Brain Stung, where they decided they're going to parody the saddest movie of all time. And then when everyone's crying and sad, that's when it'll take over the world. Uh, <laughs> I love it. And so they they were gonna depress everyone. And we when we I know we got our notes back from from Spielberg. They were like. I love that somebody's parodying Brian's song. So, I mean, it was a, a, a two percenter at best, and uh, I, I I liked that he appreciated it. It was it was fun. Well, that, you know, it's really nice to know that the guy steering the boat is on board with you guys. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think his thing is like if if I'm gonna put my name on it, I want it to mean something. I don't think he half does anything. He's very very into all the stuff he does. That's my assessment. I mean, it's limited, but that's my understanding of it. Is that he just likes being involved in stuff that's great i mean that's kind of the impression i got from him just from watching interviews over the years uh it's just nice to see that that's or to hear that that's uh how it actually is yeah definitely and and again that's such a rarity such a huge rarity sure and so you mentioned being 25 when working with him how did you get started in animation then so i was an actor for a long time I had worked in the Henson's Creature Shop for a while. Oh, wow. And then felt like this, I did the Flintstones movie there and some other stuff. And then after that ended, I was sort of casting around. I always wanted to be an actor. I went to college. I went to NYU and CSUN and a bunch of other places to try and 
become an actor. And I found myself in a sketch comedy group out here in L.A. They were trying to rival uh, the Groundlings, who have you know since gone on to become kind of a big place because so many SNL talent have have gone there. Um, oh sure. And Acme was a hotbed of writing talent at that time. A lot of writers who have gone on to SNL and other other big things have come out of there. I found myself there doing sketch comedy, and uh, this guy got on stage who was a very he was a, he was a physical comic, sort of like myself. The stuff I did was sort of absurdist, and I've always been a little bit of a physical comedian. I, I grew up with a steady diet of Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd, and and the you know silent, silent film is sort of where my my nerddom peaks. That is awesome. Uh, that is so good to hear. Actually, the font of knowledge that I have for silent film is useless to anyone else. Except for others who know a lot about silent film. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, I, I have an appreciation for it as a, a uh, former film studies individual myself. Oh, awesome. That's great. That's really cool. It's it's a rarity to find people who like fully appreciate well, the, it. So the, that's, that's great. I'll, I'll just to give you a little footnote. The college I went to has a theater called the Lillian Gish Theater in it. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. We got paired up to do a uh, uh, some sort of an assignment together. And it just clicked. It worked. There was an assignment in class where the our, our teacher would give us uh, an article from the paper, and we had to take an hour and come up with a sketch. It was just sort of like a you know a flex your muscles sort of thing. Brett and I, his name is Brett Bear, my partner. He and I got this article that was about this old school um, analect in Vegas called Bobby Barracini and his orang- amazing orangutan. And <laughs> okay. uh, at that time, he was being brought. Bobby Barracini was being brought up on charges for beating his monkeys. <laughs> and so oh, Brett dear. and I did this bit that was basically like the old uh, Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin bit of just like bedlam in the theater, where it started off as this monkey act, where he was the guy who was you know the the trainer, and then I was all the different monkeys where I was running through the audience, and he was chasing me, and it was just a lot of fun. And as that ended. Brett's wife had been in the Groundlings and knew Peter Hastings very well. And Peter had come to the show and he's like, this is really funny. Do you guys want to pitch ideas for Animaniacs? Because obviously the stuff you're doing is very sort of animated. You want to do you want to come come check it out? And we said, yes, of course we do. And we uh, we went into Peter and pitched. I think we pitched seven or eight different Animaniacs ideas and he bought one. Uh, the very first one we wrote was called Paper for Papa. Talk about esoteric. You know, in, in the Animaniacs episodes, they would do like, sometimes they'd do like three shorts or four, four shorts of them. And we did, a, I think it was an eight minute short about Ernest Hemingway having writer's block and the Animaniacs trying to cure him of his writer's block. And I actually that know that I actually know that episode having recently rewatched all 99 episodes of Animaniacs. Wow. That's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> I well, I, I like so, to be prepared for things. <laughs> that's 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 you're overly prepared. That's well, good. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I want to do a, a to be fair. I want to do a review of the sh- of the series in general. So it wasn't it wasn't only in preparation for this interview. <laughs> that's great. All right, good. So Peter came out of the Groundlings. Paul Rugg and my, and John McCann came out of Acme. So we were all very like it was a very tight knit. Acme based community. We all knew each other really well. And obviously at that point, Paul and John had become established as an Animaniacs writer. So we were coming in as like young guns. And Peter was like, do you want to come pitch some Pinky and the Brains? We pitched a bunch of those and, uh, and it sort of like took off from there. Pinky and the Brain is still the biggest, gets the biggest reaction. Because it's like people are just still fans of that show, which is which is kind of great. I mean, again, to me, it's kind of like one of those miracle shows where you hear the premise and you just don't think it would ever go anywhere. It's so niche sounding, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I would think that 90% of that, I think, is because of Maurice and Rob. I think those two just, they're, they're, they're simpatico on screen is... You know, you can you can feel it. You can feel those two just working in concert with each other. And it's such an oddball approach to have a guy doing Orson Welles through the voice of a mouse. It's just it all. And then Rob Paulson was just such a good counterpoint to that that I think it just sort of. I don't know where the where the the hook is, like what people love about it so much. I know people love it, and I don't doubt that. I just 
Is it the premise? Is it the voices? Is it the the joke? Yeah, I think you know. In I, for me, it's probably just it's the charm of just the two characters. That there's like a there's a, of course a buddy element there that it, almost like a, a hesitant buddy element because Brain is obviously very irritated all the time. But he's he has no one else, so he's you know in this situation that he can't get out of. He's gonna make the best of it, and that that's something kind of cute. And then beyond that, you take, of course, his very intelligent insults that are not just insults, but they are just really witty things um, that, of course, Pinky would never say. So he's saying it for himself. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is the oddball thing of Pinky would stumble into brilliance. Yes. More often than not. It really is like when you look at it from a word that view, it's in, this is talking about esoteric. It does feel like it's waiting for Godot in a yes, weird way. Yes, it is like waiting for Godot, yeah. <laughs> oh, it and, is. And it is these two characters who are just, you know they're never going to get to where they're going to go, but damn it, they're going to get up the next morning and try again. You, you know what it's kind of like is it's almost two guys that are just like, they are going to be at odds, but for better or worse... You know, they're kind of a pair. Same thing with like Batman and and the Joker. As much as they are at odds with each other, they need each other to exist. Yes, I think very much so. And and, and I think the thing that we always tried to impart, and I feel like I remember Peter doing this a lot, was just make train Tom Ruger to it to a level two, although our interaction was lesser with Tom, which was we wanted to make sure that even in his frustration with Pinky that it was clear they had a deep affection for each other. Yeah, you know, the the one I just watched recently uh, was the one about um, uh, Napoleon. And the moment about that show that was interesting to me was Pinky had caused a major explosion and Brain was about to smack him and he's standing there and he's like grunting and groaning and looking like he's going to throw a punch and he doesn't. And instead, he slams his own head against the floor several times before looking at the camera and saying, I am renewed. And I was like, why on <laughs> earth? He has <laughs> he has no reason to, to hold himself back, but he did. And I'm like, there must be some kind of underlying, you know, either he knows it won't do any good or he ultimately knows that like he doesn't really want to hurt him. Something like that. But it was a really interesting moment. Right. No, I think that's that's the sort of the core of the show. I mean, again, to go as pretentious as possible, my understanding of the construction of Waiting for Godot from an interview with Samuel Beckett was that he was on a, road, a very long road trip with his wife, and there was that reflection of the moment where they it got into a heated exchange, then it was very loving, and it was heated again, and it was loving, and it was one of those moments where I think he had that revelation of, like, you, you get the person in your life that you need, not the person you necessarily want, and that's good. And I think that's sort of like the edict, without knowing it, that's the edict we worked off of thinking the brain, which is these people, I can't believe I just made that smooth of a bridge between Beckett and... Yeah, that was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Good job there, Dave. (laughs) I'm very... I'm incredibly smart. That that Um, sounded really, uh, like, planned and thought out, and you're going to have everybody fooled here in a minute. Yeah, no, I'm a complete idiot. Um, uh, <laughs> I was only there for, for for a short amount of time. But while we were there, I think Peter's move was to make sure that those two were always in lockstep, for better or for worse. Two sides of the same coin. But at that time, we were trying to figure out who, like, where Pinky and the Brain lived and what the world was. And the primetime show was supposed to be Pinky and the Brain have a show called Pinky and the Brain. But after work, they're still Pinky and the Brain. They're still trying to think over the world. But they're living in the Hollywood community and um, oh my gosh. interacting with people in Hollywood. Uh, I think their next-door neighbor was supposed to be Bob Newhart originally. Uh, like Bob was going to be their sort of like um, Wilson on uh, on uh, uh, Home Improvement. Home Improvement, yeah. He was going to be like their, their wise neighbor next door. And they were going to have those kind of interactions, like the player. <laughs> but it just never materialized because people realized very quickly that this is not The Simpsons. So, so wait a minute. That was going to be the show or that, that was an episode? That was going to be a show. And I think there are episodes that that is apparent in and it's probably wildly confusing, uh, but it didn't end up materializing. Okay. Cause that sounds, your, your description sounds like something I feel like I've watched before. Uh, but the other thing I, when you said trying to figure out where they live, they kind of were treated at least from what I can tell, they were treated similar to Ren and Stimpy in the sense that depending on what the story needed, that was where they lived. Yes. Well, they were always in the Acme lab. Like that was, that was their, yeah, but, but the their, whole, but the whole Napoleon thing, like that's not really the Acme labs anymore. You know what right. I mean? Yes. Very true. 
It was a matter of convenience, for sure. Like, they could yes. be anywhere in the world at any time. Yeah, like, the Simpsons can go anywhere and do anything, but they always live in on on Evergreen Terrace. You know what I mean? They, they kind of keep yes. that. But there are shows, like, sometimes, like, Pinking in the Brain, and especially Animaniacs. My gosh, how many times they jumped history where, yes. where the characters just, they defied the logic of time. Yeah, that was definitely, uh, uh, that show definitely was able to be a little more meta than Piggy the Brand. Piggy the Brand, I think we tried to keep it as real as humanly possible, knowing the lengths we would go to, you know, for the episodes, but I think they tried to keep it as grounded. There are some jokes that permeated every episode, regardless of who wrote them. And, right. and one of those jokes that I love, and I'm not sure if you ever got to use it yourself, I just love when when brain would just kind of spill the beans and someone would ask him what the, what their deal was. And he would just flat out tell them exactly who they were and what they were trying to do. (laughs) And that to me is some of the funniest stuff because the reaction from the the people he would tell it to was usually like, Oh my gosh, you're such a, such a clever witty guy or, but I just thought that was one of the funniest things. I like, yeah, I like that, that sort of meta ish part of it too. Uh, and that's like one of the winkier moments of the show. And I, I do, I did enjoy that. You got to use that yourself then? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I think it was sort of part of the DNA of the show. Yeah, yeah. Bit, they knew they had this perfect cover of being mice. Right. And, and, uh, and, and the one, another one I saw recently, there's an envelope. He had to mail in, he had to mail in a tape of him being a stand up comedian. and then like the return address is simply acme labs so i mean (laughs) like like anybody who would have a brain would look at that and go i'm sorry acme labs why yeah it's it's as famous as the white house you can just send a letter yeah 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 and well and then the the guy the guy from the studio who, who he's sending the tape to calls and gets the answering machine and it's somebody from it's a scientist from the lab explaining that the lab ran out ran out of funding and he's (laughs) And he's like, he's like, oh, what a clever answering machine. And I'm like, wow, everybody's really a moron in this show. Yeah, everyone's dumb. Hollywood's dumb. Everything's dumb. This guy's smart, but he's a mouse and he's inept. So yes. Everybody in the universe is pretty dumb. I mean, there's that, there's that mythic thing about the theme song of Pinky and the Brain, which I, I'd only discovered recently about which character they're talking about. Do you know this thing? Oh, I've never heard. You mean, you mean when they say one is a genius, they're referring to Pinky? That, that they might be talking about Pinky, which so there was a website up there, and I'd have to go back and find it. I don't remember who it was. Oh, that's they, clever. They lay out like arguments about why that holds water, and it's pretty. It's pretty solid. Like the reasoning is pretty great. That's kind of cool. I have to I have to see if I can find that online. You also, it definitely changes your perspective on the show, for sure. Well, there are, like you said, there's, you know, one of my other favorite running gags is when Pinky would say, oh, wait, no, no, no. You know, he would always find why the plan wouldn't work. And that was also kind of brilliant because there were times where he was spot on, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I think I think we looked at it, I don't know if we put these clear terms on it, but I think we always sort of assumed that, um, you know, Pinky was Edith. You know, you know oh, the heart, yeah. the, the, the emotional underpinning of the show, and that the brain was more like this sort of straightforward my my way or the highway guy, like Archie. At its core, Pinky had a point of view. He just had a weird way of getting it out there. Obviously, he was a lunatic, but there was also some some truth to what he was doing. Well, and, yeah. I, and I really do think, from a writer standpoint, that was an important thing. It's very easy to go off the rails on a character like that. Oh yes, so we needed a yes. wholesome truth for him. Absolutely. They and again, similar to Ren and Stimpy, they fell into this uh, weird relationship thing. There was one where Brain is like he has to go to a day job, and when he comes home, Pinky is like, "Oh, it's it's always how is your day, never how is my day." <laughs> right, right. But it's been one yeah, day. Right. It's been like. <laughs> You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> those kind of things got me laughing. It's interesting reopening the uh, the trunk on this one because it's been a while since I thought about it. Now I want to go back and watch, you know, some of the weirder ones towards the end that I wrote. Like, I think we did a parody of Godspell that people hated, but I want to I want to watch it again. Oh, I, I absolutely <laughs> want to watch that because I I was in Godspell as a kid. <laughs> Actually, what it started out with, Brett and I are such fans of 
weird movies that that was supposed to be a parody of Billy Jack that just became Billy Jack and God's. It's a very weird episode. I remember reading some of the uh, the used groups at that time because the internet wasn't quite as big as it is now back in the old days. That dates me to a certain point. <laughs> but people hated, hated, hated that episode. Oh my God, they hated it. Hated so much. Wow, that's actually, that's kind of fascinating. I, I didn't know there was a hated episode of Pinky in the Brain. Oh, they despise it. They were like, Finkel and Bear ruined everything. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, I, now I, okay, well, now I want to urge everybody to go out and watch that episode. <laughs> yeah, I want to watch it because it, it, it might be right. It might be terrible. <laughs> so I was just trying to earn a paycheck, folks. <laughs> <laughs> got to do what you got to do sometimes, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. So how would you say then writing for animation that that's different than live action or or is it different? It is. I mean, you know, first of all, when you're in children's television or, or animation and even The Simpsons is more like network television than it is like Animaniacs or, you know, those shows in that you are at the mercy of your network and your advertisers and you really have to sort of play to that. Like your bottom line is going to be your network telling you and your studio telling you we need this to be this because we want to make a certain amount of money. I mean, it's all about monetization, isn't it? And I think the difference for animation, at least in those days, was how do we reach this bar of, I think at that point is 60 episodes is my, is my memory, maybe 90. It's like, we just need to, we need to do 90 episodes because we need to make, you know, make enough that we could strip them, meaning we could play them five days a week somewhere and we can syndicate it and we could package it for other countries and they can redub it. So the, the bottom line was slightly different. And because of that, I think it was a much more freeing experience because the scrutiny wasn't the same. It was very much like, let's just fill it. So you had the, you had the freedom to be able to create what you want to create to a, to a degree. I mean, you had broadcast standards and practices looking at your, at your scripts and, and saying, well, you can't do that. You know, that's too far. And and you have to you're trying to function on two levels. Peter would always you know keep driving the point of like we want to make sure this is funny to adults and to kids. So let's let's make sure that we're you know taking care of both sides of the coin. So you couldn't go too far one way or the other. And, and trying to find that sweet spot is that's the trick. You also worked on Duckman at one point. I did. I did one episode for Duckman that was based on a book called Feck is in Wreck. Uh, but we went in and pitched a bunch of ideas once again, and they bought the Feck is in Wreck parody, and we wrote it, and I think once we turned it in, they said, thank you, and that was the end of it, and they rewrote the entire thing from top to bottom. So oh, no. I didn't have a ton of time there. Yeah. That was a whole different experience, too, because they had their own bona fide writer's room. They took the script. You know, that's the thing about these shows, and I didn't know it at that time. It's like, these are guys that spend 24-7 with these characters, and we're just these freelancers that came in and tried to, like, nail the voice, and, uh, you know, for better or for worse. At that same time, Brett and I got to write the CD-ROM game of Duckman, uh, <laughs> which was a mammoth undertaking. It was like writing thousands and thousands of jokes uh, for this sort of choose your adventure style game. So no matter, you know, if Duckman went that way, then he'd have a joke in that direction. If he went the other way, then he'd have a joke there. And it was, that was heavy duty. That was joke writing 101. I, I don't even remember seeing, like, I couldn't even get a copy of the game. I kind of want to find it now. <laughs> that's how low I was with the total ball. Yeah, not, but now I want to find it. Like, that's actually really cool. <laughs> um, I, if you find it, let me know. I'd love to see it. I will. The jokes, cause, you know, when you run a, a network, you know, any show, like, uh, I think the scripts for Pinky and the Brain were like, 15 pages for the shorter ones, maybe 20 pages for the, for the full length. The script for the Duckman game, I want to say, was about 600 pages. Oh my gosh. It was massive. So I guess the question I have regarding Duckman, even though, even though your experience was a different one, is it kind of hard, or is it harder to sustain energy for a longer format show where the episode is the full half hour? I find shorter harder. Because you still have to tell a, a conventional story. You still, you still have to tell a beginning, middle, and end. And on Pinky, it was definitely more fun to do the long ones because it let you, you got to be able to like take these little side trips and, and you could stack up jokes in a kind of a way that you couldn't. You had to be really economical when you're doing those short, I think there were eight or seven minutes, whatever they were. You have to be very economical and it just spreads and you know that when you see it, the best stuff is going to be cut out because it just, there's just no time. So at least with the 22 minute episode, you could really dig in and find craft some funny bits. And I prefer that myself. 
it, it's been a long time since I've written any short form stuff, but um, I, that was my my memory of it. It's just it's hard to jam stuff into a small space. Oh yeah, well, apartment life has taught me that alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, uh, that's exactly right. Because like, <laughs> no matter what, when you're when you're doing these these episodes, you have to follow conventional storytelling techniques. Otherwise, it's unless you're doing something like the uh, you know Animaniacs that periodically do these songs or like these short interstitials. Those are different. And they, they they exist of their own. And you know the reason why uh, why this is so poignant is because they're they're bringing Animaniacs back next year. They are. Yeah. yeah are you going to be involved in any way? No, no, no. I haven't. I've not been asked no no i think i want to the adage of like you can't go back i think is very true here that period of time exists as a really powerful informative time in my life and i don't think that i can like going back would be trying to capture something that has passed and you know it works both ways i think part of it would be tough to wrap my head around that style of writing at this point but then secondarily i think it would be like like that kind of comedy has moved to a whole different thing and i also think that it's just sort of like i I wouldn't know how to do it not that it's i feel like i'm sounding like it's i'm saying it's beneath me it's not at all i don't know how to be that free anymore wow you mean like you've been what restricted in current forms of writing that it's no longer that way yeah you know restriction is a tough word it's just different it's very different there's just certain things you have to do when you're doing network television. Also, you can be a little filthier. I mean, New Girl is a filthy show. It could be hard for me to turn that off, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, um, that, that's, there's something to be said for that. But I, I will also say it seems like the 90s were kind of this golden era for animation in a way. Yes. And it's it's I, like you really – like you said, you can't recreate that because – Without going on too big of a tangent, shows like Freakazoid, I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, I mean, it, and it, it's such a part of who Paul was at that time. And That's he's cool. still, like, he, he'll post stuff on Facebook that's just astonishing. He's he's just a genius. Um, and Freakazoid was definitely an extension of, of the stuff that Paul just exceeds. He beats us all out. He's so good. <laughs> well, I have one more question for you uh, before we wrap up here. Sure. As far as uh, like writer's choice, if you you know can pick the kinds of characters to write for now that you've done a, a number of different characters, is there something that you just kind of find yourself gravitating towards? The thing that I always like to try and find is the like the honesty of a character somewhere in there. The way I operate and the way I've always done my own comedy stuff, my own sketch stuff, everything I've ever always done has been very sort of abs- with an absurdist angle. But the thing that made the absurdist in the classical sense, great, was that there were two things. One, the characters had an organic tether to Earth in some capacity. Maybe it wasn't what you'd, you know, conventionally see. And the other is that they, that the world that they were operating with in had its own set rules that you had to adhere to. You can't have Picky suddenly go murder the guy because right. that's not who he is. Right, right. But I think the audience can buy anything with a character as long as you walk in there in a way that makes sense for the character. And that's sort of what I like to operate from on anything is like making sure I understand the wiring of the characters I'm working with. And it's probably ultimately why I didn't, why the, the duck dance script was unsuccessful for us because we weren't in, we weren't under the hood on that one. That if I had the time to really root around on it, I'd probably have found a completely different access point for it. And that, that felt honest. I kind of feel like if you had that, that would be one of your favorite shows to have written for, because it seems like it's absolutely in your wheelhouse. Oh, totally, because that's a show that's completely about nuance. Yes, that was a writer's show, in my opinion. That was a show that, of course, the art style was amazing, but it was a, truly a writer's show. Yeah, I mean, it, art was classy chupo in the, in the finest sense. It was exactly what you'd expect, and I think the writing was exemplary, and it was very, very adult. But yeah, I don't think we fully got it. Also, it, you know, it's very easy to say... If you can write this animation, you can write that animation. But that's like saying you, if you can write The Simpsons, you can go write out a family guy. I don't think that's a fair assessment. I think that there's a very clear dividing line between those ideologies. Yeah, I mean, it's like trying to jump from being a country music star into being a pop star. A lot of people try it, but exactly. it doesn't always work. Exactly. For me, the thing that's always been most exciting in anything I've ever written and the stuff that's actually stuck with me are the things that I can like that you want to live in. You want to like be there and look at it from every angle you can. That's where the best comedy comes from because comedy always comes from truth and, and you can't get to truth unless you know who you're writing for. 
There you go. That so, I mean, if truer words were never spoken on that one. <laughs> well, I know really everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to say, but I got the impression that you knew everything. So yep, yep, you figured me out. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy to figure out once you, once you get behind that one fact. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, it's, it's really been a pleasure having you on the show, honestly, and uh, thanks for showing a little bit of behind the scenes on on you know some of the Steven Spielberg stuff and some of the uh, various other series you've worked on that I you know I just didn't know that you were that involved in. So thanks for all that. I'm glad to doing it. Soon after this is muffled, I uh, I will shave my beard next time. No, no, don't no, shave your beard. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's gonna do it for tonight's episode. I'd like to thank my special guest Dave Finkel for reminiscing with me here about Pinky and the Brain, while also providing some incredible insight into the animation industry as a whole. The music you heard was the ending credits theme to Pinky and the Brain, composed by Richard Stone. And if you'd like to catch up on the show yourself, be sure to stream it today on Hulu. If you enjoyed tonight's show and would like to subscribe to stay tuned, please join me over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash filmaki. Not only are there cool rewards, but you can also stream this show anytime you like, which means never missing an episode. I've been Phil Maki, you've been a wonderful audience, and until next Sunday, keep those eyeballs peeled, those ears open, and be sure to stay tuned. (laughs) 